Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. We are making good progress through chapter 14, which is the 14th chapter, obviously, of the A Level Biology syllabus. Um, this is homeostasis. So if you haven't watched the previous videos where I discussed thermoregulation and also discuss um, control of water potential in the body and how the kidneys make urine, please make sure you do so, particularly the section about urine production, because I have seen in many past questions that that is often selected as part of a 15 mark question at the end of paper four. So please have a look at that if you haven't. Today we are going to do control of blood glucose and I have made this just one video because it's just very easy direct information and I think it's more relatable to students because um, you've been aware of things like diabetes or um, any other dietary issues that might arise as a result of the body not being able to control blood glucose. So let us get into it without much ado. All right, so when we um, go and we consume our food, so for example, when you wake up in the morning and you feel like having a very nice uh, big breakfast, so you make yourself some eggs, some toast, bacon, um, cheese, and every other thing you can think of. Um, I'm not really a big eater, so I just ran out of ideas there. Uh, but what happens after you consume carbohydrates, for example, the carbs will be broken down to glucose in your body, um, and then glucose is converted to glycogen and glycogen is stored um, in the liver and muscle cells where it can be easily broken down back to glucose. Now remember this now leads us to chapter 2 when glucose is converted to glycogen, we are simply adding repeating units of glucose together, and that leads us to the formation of a glycosidic bond. And you might think, well, I don't need to know that here. But with CIE questions, some of the questions are stacked in ways that you would be shocked to find content from like your AS level picking through in your A level exam. So please don't lose sight of these little bits of information that just help you understand better. Now, in healthy people, um, blood glucose concentration is between 80 and 120 milligrams of glucose um, per 100 mils of blood. If this concentration decreases beneath this range, then obviously things would not happen as normal because the cells need glucose to respire and to carry out other functions. Glucose, remember we said in respiration, is the preferred fuel for most of the cells, particularly the brain cells. When the concentration is higher than this range, um, then you can have issues with diabetes. So this is just to say that when we started homeostasis and we were discussing things like the set point, um, the set range or what you might call the set point in this case for glucose is between 80 and 100 milligrams of glucose per 100 mils of blood. Now let's look at the basics of how blood glucose concentration is controlled. We have a very important structure called the pancreas and the pancreas, I'm just going to use a red pen here so you can see, is this yellowish structure over here. Um, the pancreas is an endocrine tissue, so it means that the pancreas is involved in hormone secretion and it is made up of a group of cells that are called the islets of Langerhans. These islets have two types of cells. They have the alpha cells that secrete glucagon and the beta cells that secrete insulin. Now, insulin is the more commonly known one because we know that it controls blood glucose concentration, but so does glucagon. I also feel the need to tell students here, whenever I get here, that insulin does not break down glucose. It is the one that stimulates the, um, it doesn't um, store glucose rather, it's the one that stimulates the reaction. So insulin is a hormone, it doesn't react directly with glucose. So let's look at what um, insulin and glucagon do. Insulin is for when glucose concentration is high. So again, when you wake up and you have a big breakfast and all of these things, your blood glucose concentration will spike. What insulin then does is that it will bind to receptors on the cell membranes to stimulate the cells to absorb glucose at a faster rate and convert it to glycogen. So simply, 
Insulin is saying it's like a signal molecule that goes to the cell membrane, binds to the receptors on the cell membrane to say, listen, you need to take up more glucose from the blood because the blood glucose concentration is high. What insulin also does is that it stimulates the activation of, a, of an enzyme called glucokinase. And what glucokinase will do is that it will phosphorylate glucose once glucose gets into the cells so that glucose would not be able to leave the cells through the transport proteins. So glucose phosphate, as you might want to call it after it's phosphorylated, cannot travel through the carrier proteins in the surface membrane. So insulin is the hormone that is also responsible for that. And I'm sure if you remember respiration, you'll remember that when we have glucose in glycolysis, it is first phosphorylated um, to glucose phosphate before it then goes on to become fructose phosphate and so on and so forth. If you've forgotten that, please watch the respiration videos. Okay, insulin will also stimulate phosphofructokinase and glycogen synthase, and these enzymes help with the conversion of glucose to glycogen. So insulin is simply a signal molecule that allows for all of these reactions to happen. When glucose concentration is low, and this can happen, believe it or not, um, especially if you've been depriving yourself of food, you've not been eating right, what will happen in that case is that the beta cells from the islets of Langerhans would not secrete insulin. So they stop the secretion of insulin. And instead, the alpha cells are the ones that start to secrete glucagon. Glucagon is an enzyme that enables the breakdown of glycogen to glucose. So when you go out for exercise, for example, early in the morning, you haven't had anything to eat, your glucagon gets to work in the sense that you probably have low blood glucose concentration during that time. So glucagon will go into the muscles and enable the muscle cells, break down the glycogen that they have stored into glucose so that you can carry out respiration and have energy. So it means that the uptake of um, glucose by the liver and the muscle cells will decrease when glucagon is being secreted. Glucagon will bind to cell receptors just like insulin and it activates what we call a cell signaling process. We already discussed cell signaling in chapter four, so make sure you have a look at it. But I think on the slide, I also put a schematic from the textbook that we can have a look at together. And this is the schematic. So this is from chapter 14 of the textbook. And you can see there that outside the liver cells, glucagon would then come and it binds to a receptor on the surface of the cell membrane that leads to the activation of a G protein. The G protein activates an enzyme. The enzyme will then uh, produce cyclic AMP from ATP. Cyclic AMP will then result in what we call an enzyme cascade over there and that ends in glycogen being broken down to glucose. Now, it's not very often that I see questions on this particular pathway, but I often tell students to just try to learn the steps just in case they come across it because you never know. This would make a very good five mark question. It is also important for you to note that you can make glucose from amino acids and from lipids. So if your body is totally deprived of glycogen um, and you're not taking in any glucose, then in that case, the body will resort to using the lipids and the amino acids in the body to make glucose in a process that's called gluconeogenesis. And just like the name suggests, gluco meaning glucose, neo meaning new, genesis, so you can think of that as beginning or making, um, depending on how you see it. But it's just a process through which glucose is made from substances that are not typically carbohydrates. Blood glucose concentration is hardly constant. What this means is that your blood glucose fluctuates throughout the day. Um, and again, this brings us back to the issue of set point. Remember I said with the set point, we are really referring to a set range, if we want to think of it that way, because we don't have a fixed number for many of these things. Even if we have a fixed number, the natural processes of the body ensure that we rather have a fixed range as opposed to a fixed number. Whenever you secrete adrenaline into the body, you can increase the blood glucose concentration. So remember when we were discussing thermoregulation, we said that adrenaline results in increased metabolism. And what this means then is that there's an increase of blood glucose concentration because you need to break down glucose to give the energy that adrenaline is requesting. Um, and so that's because adrenaline can bind to receptors to break down glycogen in the liver 
or it can stimulate the breakdown of glycogen um, during exercise. So when you get a high during a good run out in the countryside or you're just running down the street and you're able to take note of the trees that are blooming in, in the spring or the autumn leaves that are falling, the, no matter what it is that you're doing, adrenaline can be responsible for the breakdown of certain compounds like glycogen to produce glucose for that run. Now, what would happen if we don't regulate glucose? I'm sure all of you already know that diabetes would be the issue um, for the most part. This is a graph um, or a, an image I showed to my students just to show them the distribution of diabetes across the world and where diabetes is most prevalent. Um, so you would see that um, in some countries, mostly in Africa, numbers tend to be quite low. But if you're looking towards North America and also like um, Russia and um, some parts of like Asia, you would find that over there, the concentration is really high um, of diabetes or the occurrence of diabetes is quite high. And this can mostly be due to diabetes um, as, a, as a condition can be due to either a genetic condition or to lifestyle factors and we're going to look at those two on the next slide. So diabetes is a very common metabolic disease um, and many people struggle with it and it can be very debilitating but also if you live in a place where health access is great then you might um, not suffer as much because you'll be able to access all the things that you need to help you. There are two types of diabetes. You have type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, it is mostly considered a genetic condition whereby the pancreas is unable to secrete enough insulin. Um, so that means that there might be a genetic factor that is preventing the pancreas from making insulin that is functional or even making insulin that is, um, that even making enough insulin for that matter. So type 1 diabetes for this reason is called insulin dependent diabetes, um, which means that it is diabetes that's caused not because of a lifestyle factor, but because the genes that code for insulin might have a mutation of some sort. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas does secrete insulin, but the liver and muscle cells don't respond to that insulin. And this often starts later in life due to a result of diet. Um, and also when people suffer from obesity, they're likely to have type 2 diabetes. Now, when you go to the doctor most of the time and you say, oh, I want to do a quick checkup just to make sure everything is OK, um, you'd be asked to take a urine test and you'd also you'd be tested for um, diabetes using this test. A urine test can test for the presence of glucose and ketones in the urine. Now, remember when we were discussing reabsorption in the kidneys, and if you haven't watched that video, I suggest that you just go back and watch it because as you might be able to tell, many of the things that we discuss as we go on in this chapter are sort of linked to each other. When we were discussing that, we said that glucose is reabsorbed from the kidneys um, in the proximal convoluted tubule. It's reabsorbed from the nephron rather. And we also said things like uh, proteins don't make it into the urine because they are too large. And that simply means that also ketones don't make it into the urine uh, because they are reabsorbed, they're used for energy. So whenever you have the presence of glucose in the kidneys, it not only does it indicate um, diabetes, it might also indicate a problem with reabsorption in the kidneys. So when blood glucose concentration is high, um, higher than the threshold known as the renal threshold, it means that not all the glucose has been reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule and some of them will be present in the urine. When ketones are, um, and proteins are also present, it shows that the kidneys have a problem uh, because ketones should be too large to filter through the kidneys. So if for some reason they end up in the urine, then it means that there is a problem um, with the kidney and the person needs to get checked. So how do we test for diabetes? There are two key ways that you might be able to do it. One of them, well, might seem a little bit outdated, um, and that is called the dipstick. So the dipstick is used to test for the presence of glucose, it's used to test for ketones and proteins, and also used to check the pH of urine. Now on these dipsticks, and you've probably see them, seen them before, they're like strips of paper. And these strips of paper have enzymes on them. So they're not just mere pieces of paper. They have enzymes on them that would react with compounds in the urine in order to let us know if there's too much glucose in the urine or if there are ketones present in the urine. 
So the two enzymes on the dipsticks are the glucose oxidase and peroxidase enzymes. Glucose peroxidase will react with glucose in the urine to produce a compound called gluconolactone. Now, that reaction also results in the production of hydrogen peroxide. If you're into chemistry, I'm sure you can work out what the chemical reaction of, um, of that is. The peroxidase enzyme will catalyze a reaction between hydrogen peroxide and another chemical on the dipstick called potassium iodide. And what this results in is the production of different colors that would show how high or low the concentration of glucose is. Now, if you remember from chapter two where you did food tests, you said you could test for the presence of glucose using Benedict's solution. And what you would get is different colors. So you would get yellow, you would get blue if there's no glucose at all, you would get green, red, orange, all of those colors. The dipstick also gives the same colors, except in this case, it is using enzymes to break down the glucose. So glucose oxidase comes, reacts with glucose, and produces gluconolactone and hydrogen peroxide. The peroxidase enzyme on the dipstick will then react that hydrogen peroxide that has been produced with another chemical on the dipstick called the potassium iodide. And that then tells us through colors how much glucose is present. The obvious disadvantage of this is that you can't know the specific concentration of glucose because you're simply reading a color chart. So you know that, okay, if I look at it and I see blue, it means there is no concentration of glucose inside this urine. But what if I see green? Okay, how much glucose is that? Is it 50 milligrams of glucose? Is it 100 milligrams? What does it mean exactly? So this is not a very reliable method, but it is a quick way to diagnose if a person has has glucose in their urine. The second way to test for glucose is by using biosensors. And I think this is the one you might be more familiar with because they involve just pricking your finger, taking a little bit of blood, which is often like a drop of blood. And through that blood, it is easier for you to measure how much glucose um, is in the blood. What biosensors have is they also have a pad that has glucose oxidase, and that again will react with glucose to produce gluconolactone. Simultaneously, an electric current is generated, and this current is often generated based on the reaction between glucose oxidase and glucose. That electric current will be detected by an electrode and it would be read by the meter which produces it as a glucose reading. So basically what this current is doing is saying that based on the amount of glucose that is able to react with the glucose oxidase on the biosensor pad, it is able to say this is how much current should be generated and that is converted to a glucose reading. This is the end of blood glucose control, and I'm sure you are so relieved because homeostasis is quite long, but we are not done with homeostasis yet. We still have just one last section, which is homeostasis in plants. So please make sure you check that out as well. It is sometimes a five mark question. Thank you all so much for listening. Until the next video, have a good time.